rather than think about fat as something you got to cut out, burn out, poison, uh, uh, what we should be doing is really thinking about how do we tame our fat? How do we manage it? And that secret is actually in, lies within our own body. So one thing I love about your new book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is that it challenges people to rethink the entire relationship between body fat and health. And the truth is fat is not all that bad. So can you tell us more? That's a good starting off point. Right. Well, I think all of us have had the same personal experience. You get up in the morning, you take a shower, you step out under the corner of your eye, you look in the mirror and you see a lump or a bump that you didn't think should be there. And then you step on a scale and the number may or may not be the number that you are hoping for. And immediately you begin cursing your fitness and cursing your fat. And as adults, I think this common experience of vilifying fat has led our entire society, including the medical community, to really kind of be biased against a tissue that isn't just a birthright, meaning that we form body fat in our mom's womb, but in fact is an actual organ in our body. And this appreciation of normal healthy fat being very important for our physiological function, our physiological health, our immune system, our ability to have a good metabolism is something that's now really becoming sharply coming into focus with some of the new, latest research on human metabolism. So is it okay uh, to have a little bit of love handle? Is that what you're trying to convince me is okay when I look in the mirror? No, actually what I'm trying to say is that we have a, uh, uh, a, a new opportunity to rethink our assumptions about body fat. And the fact of the matter is, is that fat is an organ uh, in our body, just like our pancreas and our spleen, and our liver and our lungs. And we need to respect that. Uh, we need to tame it. Uh, and the reason is that fat has multiple functions. It happens to be one of these remarkable tissues like your blood vessels and nerves that do a lot of different things. Our fat actually has different jobs that it actually does. One of the obvious ones is it kind of keeps us warm, um, but not like blubber. It actually keeps us warm because it has the ability to generate heat. And that's something that is brown fat, which is one color of fat that we need to know about. But the other things that fat does, it forms a cushion. And if we didn't have fat as a cushion, not just on the outside of our body, but even packed inside the tube of our body, if we slipped on a rug and fell, our organs might split open. And so we have this cushion uh, effect. The other thing that's really important is that our fat cells from the time we're babies act as fuel tanks the fuel coming from our food and our metabolism storing that energy from our food into our fuel tanks in the same way that you would pull your car over to the filling station when your fuel gauge runs low. Our body fat really is our gas tank. So we, we draw energy from that. And then finally, this idea of fat being an, not, not just an organ, but an endocrine organ secreting hormones, hormones like leptin that acts as a volume switch to our appetite. Um, hormones like adiponectin, a hormone that is a thousand times higher circulating in your blood than almost any other organ uh, or any other hormone that's out there. Why is it so important? Because this fat, normal fat hormone participates with insulin to help us, our metabolism become more efficient in drawing down and, and bringing it on board the energy into our body. Or hormones like resistin, which if adiponectin is the gas pedal, to allow us to absorb energy faster, resistant is the break, you know? And so in our normal fat function, our normal healthy fat, which by the way, you know, if you think about it, we, 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 we uh, vilify fat as destroying our body shape. But in fact, from the time that we were children where boys and girls are all looking the same way to form those beautiful contours of the human body, that's our fat also doing that as well our cheeks, uh, uh, how our body is shaped, every aspect. We have something to respect about fat. Having the right amount of fat is absolutely vital for beauty and health. And having too much of it is very disruptive. And so rather than think about fat as something you got to cut out, burn out, poison, uh, uh, what we should be doing is really think about how do we tame our fat? How do we manage it? 
And that secret is actually in, lies within our own body. So is there, is there a right amount of fat that we should have, or is it more important where our fat that we have is located? I know you talk a lot about this in the book. Maybe that's a good place to go now. Yeah, look, it's kind of all of the above, but let, let, maybe we, what we should do is break down fat into first um, the two colors that it comes in, right? Like we can be really simple about it. You go to the hardware store and you're gonna paint your room and you only have two colors to choose from uh, on the wall of paint. Well, when it comes to fat, you got brown fat uh, and you've got white fat. And, uh, and they're very different by the way, which is really quite remarkable. White fat uh, is the lumpy bumpy fat. It's the uh, wiggly and jiggly as I kind of say it. And it can either be um, near the surface of your skin. We call that subcutaneous, um, uh, cutaneous being skin underneath the skin. That would be underneath your arm, underneath your chin. Uh, that could be the love handles, the, the, the muffin top around your thighs, around your butt. These, that's the kind of fat that we see and oftentimes are you know, displeased by. Um, uh, so that's one kind of white fat. The other kind of white fat you can't see, it's not subcutaneous, it's visceral. And viscera means gut. So gut fat is packed inside the tube of our bodies. So we can't see it from the outside, but if we had a scanner, for example, we could actually check it out. And in fact, there are things, scans like DEXA scans and other types of more sophisticated scans that can detect it. But I wanted people to think about this visceral fat as the harmful fat because a little bit cushions your body and, and, and it performs all those normal hormonal functions we talked about. But a lot of it outgrows the space in your in your in the cavity of your belly and it turns into a baseball glove that chokes your organs and becomes hyper inflammable and in fact fat can leak out of that um a gut fat and and get stored in your liver and start destroying and being toxic to your liver so that so uh, white fat under the skin in your in your uh and packed in your in your body in the tube of your body gut fat perfectly normal to have just the right amount and we'll come back to just the right amount in a second. But then that's one color of fat. Um, the other kind of kind of fat is the brown, which is really interesting because brown fat is not wiggly, jiggly, lumpy, bumpy. Brown fat is wafer thin. It's paper thin. And it's not near the skin surface uh, subcutaneous. It's close to the bone. And where is it located? It's not your muffin top. It's actually pressed along your neck. And it's also formed behind your rib cage, under your arms, like a bra strap, a little bit behind your back, a little bit in your belly, scattered about. And what that brown fat does, uh, and what makes it brown, is that there's an organ, uh, there's a there's an organ within our cells called the mitochondria. And and Dr. Gunter, you'll you'll relate to this because when we were in med school, remember all that stuff we had to memorize, every organelle, every cell, every I mean, it was a nightmare. So I always thought about this tiny little brown organ, the my mitochondria, I used to memorize, I call it the mitochondria, and it's mighty indeed, because actually it's a fuel cell. It's like a little nuclear fuel cell that can generate heat. And so the purpose of brown fat, which is really remarkable, it's also found in animals that hibernate, is to actually generate heat, to consume fuel that's stored in fat, and to generate heat when it's necessary, and in response to things like cold temperature, but also in response to certain kinds of foods, which is really the cool part. Yeah, and I've, uh, I've spent my last two books uh, talking about uh, foods that activate uh, brown fat. And so I was delighted to see that we're absolutely on the same page with that. And yeah. there's, and I love about your book that there are you know, tricks we can do with food and spices uh, to actually activate brown fat. And, there's even a third type of fat that I write about that you know about, which is beige fat. And that is white fat that's transitioning to uh, more of a brown fat, more active fat. Well, that, that, that's, at the, that's at the paint store where the guy starts to mix the white <laughs> and the brown and you get that intermediate tone shade. <laughs> Let's get back to you know, where, where this fat is located. And um, in, in my original book, one of my sayings was, fat on your ass, you're built to last. Fat in your gut, you're out of luck. 
And I actually still stand by that. So uh, and you and I, I think, agree about this, that this too much visceral fat is, is really one of the worst prognostic signs that we can actually see in the mirror. We, most of us don't even need a DEXA scan to know that there's belly fat that shouldn't be there. Why, why has that been associated with bad outcomes in our health? Yeah, and, and, and not only is it associated with bad outcomes, and I think it's very important to point out that this visceral fat, this harmful fat, um, actually is not just an issue with people who are obviously overweight or obese, but even skinny people can have too much of this harmful, dangerous visceral fat. So let's be really clear, visceral fat is normal, a little bit it's normal, but when it actually grows too much in, in excess, when it becomes goes from sort of the packing peanuts that you put in a Federal Express carton, a skinny Federal Express carton when you're mailing champagne glasses, um, and it turns into a baseball glove that you're trying to stuff into the carton and it chokes your organs, then it actually becomes a very, very dangerous thing. Now, the reason it becomes dangerous, by the way, um, goes back to something really simple. And I like to explain it to you this way, and it's connected to our metabolism, the ideas of our metabolism. Everyone is used to driving a car and you don't think about the fuel that you need to run your car until you look at the fuel gauge and it's running low. When it runs low, automatically as a driver, we pull over to the filling station, pull out the nozzle, put it in a tank and fill it up. When the, when the tank is filled, the nozzle clicks and then we get back in the car and drive off. Now, when our body works the same way, our metabolism pretty much fuels our body, the engine of our body, so we can go from place to place and thing to thing. If we're a little more active, we need a little more energy. If we're less, less active, more sedentary, we need a little bit less energy, but we need energy. And our metabolism runs that process. Now, we don't have a fuel gauge that's uh, in front of our dash, but we have one in our brain. Okay, and our and our organs also sense the levels of fuel. So when we're our fuel, our body's fuel tank runs low, what do we do? We don't pull over to the filling station. We pull over to the dinner table, or to the refrigerator, or to the or to the restaurant, or to the pantry, and we fill up. So in the same way that a gas station gives fuel, i.e., gasoline to your car, which then powers the engine, the fuel in our body, okay, is really coming from our food. Uh, the quality of the gas, of course, matters, and what you load your car into. I mean, you could put some crappy low octane gas into your car from time to time, your engine will run just fine. But if you put crappy quality fuel in your car over the course of its life, your engine is not going to last so long. Same as our body. The quality of the fuel, the quality of the food that we eat can make a huge amount of difference, not on a meal, single meal basis, but over time. That's where we need to take care of our body. Now, back to the fat for a second. When we uh, uh, load up our fuel and sit down to eat. Of course, we're uh, our uh, the moment we're eating food, our pancreas, one of the other endocrine organs, secretes insulin. Insulin rises, and insulin partners with adiponectin, which is that fat hormone, and says, "Hey, let's draw some of that fuel into the body to, so that the so that the, the body can actually use it uh, for for energy." And anything more than you need to basically run the engine gets stored. Where does it get stored? It gets stored in little tiny fat cells. Fat cells are like the fuel tank, and they can actually blow up when, the, when there's more fuel in it. And unlike a filling station where the nozzle has a clicker, and, the, and so therefore more, no more gas goes into your tank, our body doesn't have that clicker, so we can keep eating. Now, imagine at the filling station, if you didn't have that clicker, the tank would fill, more gas would come out, the fuel would run out of the tank, down the side of the car, around the wheel, pool around your feet, and you'd be standing in a toxic, dangerous, flammable mess. Similarly, when we overeat and overload on fuel, now our fuel is called calories, but I don't want people to focus on calories in and calories out and counting the calories. I want people to think simply that the food that we eat is our fuel, but when we actually overload our fuel tanks, you got to make more fuel tanks, more fat, more filling, more fat, more filling. And that's basically how overeating blows up our fat mass. And at a certain point, the fuel leaks out. And that leakage actually is very toxic. When fat leaks out, lipotoxicity, um, uh, our liver is one of the air most sensitive organs to 
fat poisoning, which can happen when we overload. And the other thing is that fat, as fat expands, remarkably, and I'm a cancer researcher, it actually acts like a tumor, meaning that it can re very rapidly outgrow its own blood supply. Our fat needs a circulation too, but as it outstrips its blood supply, because we're putting just way too much fuel in our body and, this, and the tanks are getting bigger and bigger, what happens is the center of that fat mass doesn't have enough oxygen. And so it becomes inflamed, hypoxic, and it becomes inflamed. And that, that inflammation starts to seep out around the body. Now, when that happens inside the tube of our body, you got bigger mass, you got inflammation, you got seeping toxic fat, just like that overage of, of leaking gas around your, uh, around your feet if you didn't have the clicker uh, at the gas station. In a similar way, that overage of, of fuel, that that over that gigantic growth of fat cells, visceral fat especially, what it does is it wrecks the hormonal functions inside your body. So uh, leptin, which is made by fat to help control the epicyte. You know what? When fat is that confused and that inflamed, I don't know. Are you hungry or not hungry? Adiponectin, which helps insulin draw in energy. Do we want a lot or a little? I can't remember. What about the resistance to slow things down? I don't know. We're confused. And so this chaos, mass chaos, it's a riot that happens in that endocrine organ called fat in your body disrupts your, uh, disrupts really all of your functions. And that's where something that is normal, healthy, and critical, vital for your energy. When we actually abuse it or when it is abused, it needs to actually be put back into balance. And that's really why I think the real reason to control body fat is not really about vanity, it's about inner health. That's where the priority is. I want to come back to your, you know, cancer research, because I want to come back to VEGF. Uh, but I, I want to stay on this point, because you make a point that just losing five pounds makes measurable differences in this whole process. Can, can you walk us through that? Because five pounds, Okay, five pounds. I I can I can do that. Um, that. I don't. Yeah, I need to lose fifty pounds. But five pounds. Okay. Why is that so beneficial? What can we see with that? Just much weight loss. Yeah, I mean it's such an important point. I, I I title a section of my book, lose, lose a little, gain a lot, because we don't normally think that way. We think in order to get anything, you got to lose a lot, right? That's what everybody's obsession with weight loss is has always been gravitated towards. And I think that, you know, um, what we've discovered in the medical research world is that incremental weight loss pays off in a really big way. I'm gonna talk about five pounds in a second, but even losing a couple of pounds can has actually been shown to have a benefit. I mean, there've been studies of more than uh, almost 5,000 individuals across 25 clinical trials that look at weight reduction. Now, this is actually purposeful, intentional weight reduction, not the kind, you, not, not the kind of weight you lose when you're on a desert island or you've got cancer. This is purposefully trying to lose weight. And it turns out that if you lose for every two pounds of weight loss, okay, you can reduce one point of your systolic blood pressure. That's actually the top number uh, that represents how much force of your blood jutting out of, jetting out of your heart. Now, losing blood pressure, even by one point, makes a big difference because you think about how much, how many people actually on blood pressure medications with this idea that high blood pressure is a silent killer that can lead to stroke. That force that your heart pumps blood out affects every single organ in your body. So for every point you lose, you actually gain more protection of your noggin and all the other organs in your body as well. And so um, if you really think about it, uh, uh, this has been shown actually it pays off even in terms of heart failure, which is also a consequence of, of uh, high blood pressure uh, and other problems of your vascular system. But we know that losing even two pounds, all right, can lower your risk of heart failure by almost 3%. You lose four pounds, you reduce the risk by 5.6% in terms of the risk of heart failure. Now, nobody talks about that, right? Nobody thinks about like even these small amounts have big payoffs in terms of your longevity which is, you know, living well, nobody lives well with heart failure. You live well when your pump is actually good until the very end. Now let's talk about five pounds, because I think that five pounds is a reasonable goal 
for almost everyone to actually um, look at. Now, this is the study, by the way, that was done that I cite uh, that was led by the American Cancer Society. They looked at 180,000 people from the U.S., Australia and, uh, and Asia. Right. So this is a, lots of different geographical areas, lots of different lifestyle habits, body sizes. Uh, and they looked at women who were in their uh, midlife. So they were in their 50s. This is the this is the time of life where a lot of women are struggling with their weight. OK, and they were trying to correlate. Uh, uh, how much weight that they purposefully tried to lose with the diagnosis of breast cancer. And here's what they found, that those women in this 180,000 who lost five pounds, at least five pounds, and kept it off, they had an 18% decrease in the risk of developing breast cancer. That's an important lowering without taking any medication, without doing anything else, that just lowering the risk. Now, now by the way, What's the connection between uh, uh, body fat, weight loss, and cancer? Well, remember, we talked about this. When fat is growing, it becomes inflamed. Inflammation is a setup for tiny tumors sparking up and growing into deadly cancers. And remember that basically uh, uh, having this inflammation uh, and, and toxicity to your bodies leads to more free radicals in your body. Uh, it actually disrupts your immune system and your immune system actually patrols your body normally to ward off and to get rid of tiny little cancers that might be forming. So this is you know, really all the human evidence that I think we need to see to know that there are big payoffs for losing very reasonable amounts of body fat and body weight. Yeah, the other thing I, I point out to my female patients, and actually my male patients, is the fat is clearly an endocrine organ, as you mentioned, but it's also, it makes hormones like estrogen. And many of my female patients with breast cancer who are postmenopausal are shocked when I show them their uh, estrogen level, their estradiol level, and you know it's it's elevated, and they go, but that's impossible. You know, I am at a period in five years, and I said it's from your fat, and they said what? And that gets back to your study. You're absolutely right that study after study has shown that one of the big impacts of losing fat is you will reduce this hormone. Uh, and son of a gun, in my practice, they are delighted when, let's say, three months go by and they're down 10 pounds, and now their estradiol is, is either dramatically reduced or even unmeasurable. And they go, what? That, you know, the, just from my fat, I was doing that. It's true. And, and, and that's why we don't want to vilify fat. We want to understand that it, it performs this natural it's, we need to balance it. It's just part of another one of our parts of our body that we need to take care of. And I think too often we uh, uh, just live our lives the way that we do without thinking about that part of our body as yet another part that we have to maintain. Just like when you're taking care of your car, you need to have it regularly uh, maintained and everything checked out. Body fat is no different. So let's go back to kind of your, your concept of let's Let's use our body fat to lose body fat. And I want to get back to brown fat and the tricks. You and I both are very impressed with the power of food uh, to control most of what's going to happen to us. And uh, talk about how the techniques we can use to make uh, brown fat active and make brown fat burn more fat? Because I think this is really empowering to people. Yeah, well, I want to tell a tiny little story in a short time we have that gives people a better understanding that this brown fat thing is, is something that is really part of our human anatomy. But we didn't always think it was part of our anatomy. In fact, back, I, I can tell you the discovery of the uh, origins of brown fat, like how we even figured it out, date all the way back to the 17th century, um, there was a naturalist named Conrad Gessner. Naturalists are people that study the natural world. And back in the, the day, you know, they would actually 
you know, see animals and and do dissections like we used to do in med school to look at all the organs and draw pictures of them to try to figure out what they did. And so um, Conrad Gasser looked at a hibernating mammal called the alpine marmot. It looks like a like it looks like a woodchuck actually. Um, and uh, when he he recognized all the organs except for this one little brown mass, soft mass between its shoulder blades. And because he was seeing these in hibernating animals, he just called them hibernomas, the oma referring to a mass. That's how we call tumors omas, carcinoma. Um, uh, and, but he didn't know what it was. Fast forward to the um, mid 19th century at UCLA, a physiologist who really had the ability to look more deeply under the microscope of brown fat. And of course, people had then found brown fat in other hibernating animals like bats and, and things like that, and other animals like that. Uh, it was identified that, oh my gosh, this brown fat is actually, or this brown mass, hibernoma is actually made of fat. The tissue is actually fat. Now, what's really interesting is what makes brown fat brown. And I, I, you know, I'm one of these guys, uh, like just like you, Dr. Gundry. I mean, as researchers with research backgrounds, we always ask why, you know? It's probably it probably yep. was very annoying. Probably it was really annoying to our parents. Absolutely. Um, right. But 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 that's really what, you know, like people like us ask. So why is brown fat brown? It turns out that the mitochondria, the mitochondria, those fuel cells actually have a lot of iron in them. And iron, as you know, from a from a nail outside turns rusty, which is brown. And so you have lots of mitochondria, lots of these fuel cells, these little power plants packed into the brown fat because they generate heat, which makes sense to a hibernating animal. So for a long time, it was thought that only animals had this. And then when they checked out babies behind the shoulder, between the shoulder blades, um, they're like, okay, there's a little bit there, but it's probably like the appendix or the tonsils, which we now know have a real function. But when we, when you and I were, you know, in medical school, they taught us, ah, never mind, just lose them, cut them out. Um, just get rid of them. And now we know like, oh my God, they're part of the microbiome. They house our immune system. So most uh, things that stick around are used for something. Mother nature is extremely resourceful and doesn't like to waste anything. And so the brown fat in babies does kind of melt away. It becomes less prominent. Uh, and um, But it wasn't really until much later uh, uh, when PET scans were developed that look at metabolism that the discovery that brown fat was present in adults, particularly adults getting a PET scan, often for cancer uh, or for diagnosis, that it was around when they were getting scanned during the winter months in the Northeast of, of the country. Cold temperatures turn out just like hibernating animals to um, trigger the brown fat. So that so cold temperatures is one way that we can turn on brown fat. And by turning on the brown fat under the scan, the PET scan, you see this thing light up like a Christmas tree, right? And and this is actually how they figured out that cold temperature um, actually activates brown fat. And at the National Institute of Health, maybe even while you were there, uh, Dr. Gundry, they started to explore. There's a whole division that actually studies human adipose tissue or human fat. And it turns out that brown fat is actually quite prevalent in the body, but because it's paper thin, and it's usually not working too hard. It's in reserve, held in reserve, um, but it's behind our breastbone, under our arms, it's around the straps of our neck, it's a little bit in our belly, and cold temperature will activate them. But we figured out there are chemical signals that can be triggered by cold or triggered by stress hormones, like norepinephrine, um, or triggered by foods that can actually turn them on. And I, you know, I, I like to give this, uh, uh, this a little bit of this uh, demo. Um, I just happen to be here doing a lot of teaching about metabolism. But when it's cold temperature or when you're eating a food, like uh, a great example where a lot of research has been done is uh, chili peppers, the kind of stuff you put on a pizza. Okay, that'll light up your brown fat. So what does it do? Um, uh, it triggers your brain. The signal triggers the brain and your brain releases a hormone like noradrenaline that activates receptors, these cellular receptors, these light switches, electric switches on top of your brown fat, that wafer thin. And when it activates that, it triggers the mitochondria, the mitochondria to turn on its engine. And what happens? This is what it does. Let me show you. It goes like this. Boom. You get a torch light. Okay. And this, the fuel that it takes to create this kind of heat 
is drawing down fuel from another location. That other location is sto stored fat in the harmful fat. So this is how good fat, brown fat, can fight harmful fat, which is that excess visceral fat or white fat. All right, so we now know that capsicum is one of these agents that does this. Uh, most people probably aren't going to go around having chili peppers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, although some cultures absolutely do. Uh, and most of those cultures, interestingly enough, are usually quite thin. Um, are there other tricks or anything in our pantry that we can use to do the same thing? Yeah, well, you know, actually, it's been studied like tree nuts, uh, like walnuts, for example, which contain lots of great dietary fiber and some healthy fats, also can groom our gut microbiome. Good, healthy gut is not just good for your immune system and lowering inflammation, which can combat the effect of harmful fat, but also helps us streamline our metabolism, and make everything work a little bit better. And it turns out that eating just a handful of walnuts um, a couple of times a week has been shown to shrink your waist circumference. Now your waist circumference, by the way, is another great way um, to really get an idea, like your belt. It's a great way to know how much visceral fat you have because when your pants feel a little loose and you gotta actually cinch your belt that one extra inch, you're not losing guts, you're not losing intestines or liver, you're actually losing visceral fat. So that's actually kind of what we call a surrogate. Uh, a, a kind of a stand-in marker when your visceral fat starts to shrink. And, and eating tree nuts, for example, can do that. Prunes can also do that as well. Um, uh, prunes have lots of polyphenols uh, found in the plum, as well as dietary fiber uh, uh, that can actually also have that uh, effect. Uh, a number of other uh, 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 pantry items and refrigerator items. One of the things I do in my book, by the way, that uh, I had a lot of fun doing is writing the section about food in my book, the middle section, part two, I, I was writing it as an author, imagining pushing a grocery cart through the supermarket and inviting the reader to be like when they were, when we were all kids, jumping into our mom's shopping cart with her pushing us around the produce section and the middle aisles and the seafood section and the beverage section. And me literally as the author, just whispering your ear, um, here are the foods you should take that can actually activate your brown fat to help the fight the white fat make more beige fat, and also shrink your waist circumference and help you lose weight. Yeah, and it's a great technique that you do. So, you know, kudos for that. Let's get back to metabolism for a second. Mm. And I love the myth busting that you do in the book that everybody is convinced that, you know, I'm fat because I have a slow metabolism or I'm now perimenopausal, and everybody knows that my metabolism is slowing down. Uh, is, there, is there truth to this myth, or do you want to bust that one as well? Yeah, th this, was, this is perhaps the biggest mic drop that I actually put into this book, Eat to Beat Your Diet. And that is that it's um, a brand new understanding of human metabolism has emerged just in the last two years that has really led us uh, at the scientific community and the medical community to realize that a lot of the things that we used to think just ain't so. And this is, by the way, why you have to follow the science. All right. So I, I want to describe a little bit of a, I wouldn't describe a very important research study, but a little bit of in a way that everyone can understand. Um, so there was a researcher out of Duke University named Herman Ponzer who worked with almost 90 other colleagues across 20 countries. And they set out to look at human metabolism across 6,000 people, and they studied them all in exactly the same way. So this was actually the most ambitious undertaking ever in human history uh, to study metabolism. 6,000 people from across 20 countries in exactly the same way. For, how, how do they study them? They gave them a little drink of water, okay? But water we know is H2O, the H being hydrogen, the O being oxygen. And what these researchers did was really, really clever. They just chemically tweaked the hydrogen and chemically tweaked the oxygen just a little bit so that when these people drank the water, their metabolism would process those atoms. And then you could measure what the metabolism was doing in their breath or in their blood or in their urine. And they did it exactly the same way in 6,000 people. And the most surprising thing is they studied people that were two days old and 
90 plus years old. So in this research study, not only was it a huge study across different parts of the world, but they also studied the entire human lifespan from just a couple of days old all the way into the 90s. And when they actually looked at the results, what do, what kind of metabolism these people have, at the first um, analysis of the data, they found that everybody's metabolism was all over the map. Okay, just like you would expect, all right? Um, and what was really remarkable, and this is, I think, the ingenious part of their study. We now live in this big data world where we can actually take a huge amount of data and adjust it. So what they did is for every individual, they were able to adjust based on their body size and their body mass, they could subtract out the effect on metabolism of excess body fat. So for every person in this 6,000 person study, they could actually adjust and remove the effect on metabolism of excess body fat. And when they did that 6,000 times, the result of what, uh, what, what, the, what the metabolism of these people were, was like pulling the cloak off the statue of David for the first time. What they found was that all humans go through only four phases of metabolism over the course of our lives. And this is so surprising that it has huge implications on how we think about the, the changes in our body and, and how much we and why we fight um, uh, body fat and, and our, our weight over time. So let me just quickly walk through the four phases. Phase one, when we are born, we all have the same metabolism, but in the first year, first 12 months of life, from uh, day zero to the first, for, to first year, uh, one years old, our metabolism skyrockets like a rocket ship blasting off to about 50% higher than what our adult levels are gonna be, all right? So it's really important for those of you who are um, you know, thinking about like you know, the first year of life, how do you take care of a baby? Like there's a lot going on in that first year. They're absorbing everything and utilizing everything. That's phase one. Phase two is from one year old to 20 years old, okay? Um, the metabolism actually goes down, 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 down from one to 20 um, uh, to adult levels. Now, why is that surprising? Because any of us who have had kids know that during teenage years, your kids are eating two dinners. They're bouncing off the wall. They're sprouting up like a beanstalk. And you go, well, the reason that is, is because their metabolism is escalating, skyrocketing, right? Wrong. It's not. It's coming down. They're getting bigger, but their metabolism is 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 going down towards the landing that's phase two phase three and this is where the real surprise is from age 20 to age 60 this research study showed that human metabolism from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 is rock solid we are hardwired to have a rock solid metabolism that's how our operating system works that's how our metabolism is designed throughout the course of our adult lives. That's phase three. That is through um, your college, your first job, your first baby, that's through your menopause. Um, that's all that time in the 40s and 50s where everybody's struggling with their weight saying, well, it's not my fault, it's just because of my age, it's myth busted. It's, it, you know, it, it's intended, your metabolism intend to be rock solid. What that means, by the way, Dr. Gundry, is 60 can be the new 20 if you follow your inner metabolism. Now, I'm gonna come back to what happens to metabolism and why we actually have so much problems in a second. But from that's the third phase. The fourth phase is from 60 to 90. We do have a small marginal decrease in our metabolism, about 17% by the time you're 90. Your metabolism is about 17% of what it should have been in 60 and, and at 20. All right, so what happens that's really amazing in these four phases, which I published this graph in my book that I think just changes my mind you know, as a doctor who thought I knew a lot about human metabolism, I had to revise my thinking. And what I tell people is that, you know, whatever textbook you and I studied in medical school about metabolism, that's now being ripped up and a new textbook is being written based on this kind of research and the other things we're talking about. And some of those textbooks aren't published yet. So, you know, people who are listening to this are hearing really the state of the art of thinking as we are actually seeing it appear as medical professionals. Now, so what actually happens? Remember I told you this was an algorithm that allowed us to pull fat out of the system. And what was found is when you add fat back into the system, into the, uh, into the operating system, what happens is that adding the fat bank in crushes your metabolism. So it's, it's not that a slow metabolism causes you to grow fat and, slow, and, and gain weight, it's the other way around. Gaining weight, growing too much body fat through behavior, inactivity, overall stress, 
hormonal problems, all kinds of other things, actually crushes your metabolism. It's inside out. It's really upending our thoughts. But the good news is that means that actually we have the power. We have the agency to be able to address something that we used to think with our genetic destiny. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's really important, and I, I know the study you're talking about. I actually referenced it in my last two books, and it is it's it's really mind-boggling, particularly even for medical professionals uh, who you're right. We thought we knew how this worked, uh, and we were all wrong. Uh, and it is it is the fat. Okay, let's let's bring it home. You again, five pounds would make a big difference. Two pounds will make a big difference. What are the action steps? And you detail them in the book, but can you give us a brief summary? What are the action steps to get me to, to lose those five pounds and keep them off? First of all, let me kind of disclose something that is that will help you understand where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm a scientist, I'm a doctor, but I am also somebody who really enjoys the art of eating. I enjoy the taste of great food. And you and I have had many conversations about the Mediterranean meals that we have right. <laughs> um, enjoyed alone and not yet had the opportunity to enjoy together, which is coming. One of these um, days, <laughs> soon. One of these days. But but here's the thing, you know. Uh, I, before I talk about like the action steps, um, uh, you know, uh, I want to first say that uh, one of the things that makes us human is our ability to enjoy food. Our humanity is part of sitting down and breaking bread. And the reason that over tens of thousands of years, we've actually developed sophisticated cooking techniques that people sit down and enjoy and look forward to at family gatherings and at holidays is really part of who we are, our own humanity. I think that can't be under underscored. And so I titled my new book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, because specifically because you know my publisher was like, well, why don't you write a diet book? And what I decided to do is to write an anti-diet book. It's a trick title. And it's an anti-diet book because I want people to realize that for you to keep your weight off and for you to fight harmful body fat, you've got to be able to do something that you can stick to for your entire life and not feel like you are being deprived. You know, that's just why major extreme diets don't work. Elimination, deprivation, restriction, you know, the uh, human nature abhors deprivation. You tell somebody they can't do something, my brain, uh, maybe I'll do a little bit. Maybe if you're not looking, I'll go do something. All right, that doesn't work. And so number one, leaning into something that you can get behind and enjoy and aligning the pleasure of eating, rediscovering the joy of food while aligning your interests with your metabolism and health and fighting harmful body fat is exactly what I aim for in eating to beat disease. And the good news is that you can do it with some pretty easy steps. you know. And, and I like to kind of boil them down first and just sort of like, how do you go about eating we're going to talk about what to eat, but how do you go about eating over the course of your day? All right. Look, um, intermittent fasting is quite popular these days, and it sounds like it's been invented just a couple of years ago. But in fact, I want to just clear, clear up to everyone. Intermittent fasting is what we do. Like that's, you know, we intermittently eat and we intermittently don't eat when we're sleeping. And here's the thing. When we're eating, we talked about this earlier. When we're eating, our insulin levels go up to get that energy in, to store energy. Our body doesn't want to burn fuel, all right? So anything that get so we're not we're in an anti-burn fuel burn sort of perspective. We're actually storing energy and storing it into our fat as well. And when we're not eating, insulin levels go down, like when we're sleeping. And now our our metabolism switches gears. It's like switching a train track. And now it's like okay, let's go into fat burning, energy burning mode. And now you can burn, you can draw on that energy that was stored. Might have been stored during the day when you ate. Might have been storing uh, from yesterday or over the holidays, you know, and that, that's the idea to think about it. So when we're sleeping and not eating or fasting, we're actually burning our fat. So that's one of the things that we should do is learn that our body's working for us, our metabolism is working for us when we're not actually eating. So here's a couple of little tricks that make it easier for your body to burn a little bit more. Uh, let's first say that you get going to eat and sleep eight hours a day, which I hope most people try to do. 11 o'clock, you go to bed, 7 o'clock in the morning. It might be a little different, but that's eight hours, okay? Now, that's the time your body's capable of burning fuel, okay, when insulin's down. If you want to actually increase the time of burn to be able to help manage your weight, you don't need to go on anything crazy. Just let's say you eat dinner at 7 o'clock and you finish at 8, you put your dishes away. Don't snack after that. Don't eat dessert. Don't nosh and 
pick in the pantry before you go to bed. No bedtime snack. When you put the dishes away, stop eating. Let's say you can eat at seven, put your dishes away at eight. Don't eat anything from eight to 11 when you go to bed. You've just gained three extra hours of actually fuel burning, which is fat burning uh, time for your body. Get up in the morning. All right. Don't do, and so I tell people, and everyone always smiles to me. I'm like, don't do what our mommies told us to do, which is get out of bed, eat breakfast, and get under that school bus to get to school. All right. This is what I do. I get up in the morning. Uh, I get ready, take a shower. I get dressed. I might check my emails. I might go for a walk. I might check out the garden, whatever it is. Um, and I don't eat right away. I give myself an extra hour. Okay. And it's very natural for me now. And now I've gained an extra hour of time where I'm not eating, where my body can burn fuel. So think about it. Eight hours of sleep. I just uh, three hours before. Now it's 11 hours. One extra hour in the morning. I got half my day, 12 hours to burn off fuel and very reasonably. So 12 fasting, 12 not fasting. You know, people go 16 and eight, right? You know, of course, you fast longer, you're going to burn more. But even 12 hours works. And, and, and that's been studied in clinical trials. So don't sweat it like that. Like when you eat, um, is, it matters. How much you eat goes all the way back to that filling station. And when you actually um, not overload your tanks, so you're growing extra fat and storing extra fuel. Look, if you store a lot of extra fuel, you got to pay for it. It's going to take longer to burn off. Over time, it's going to be more and more difficult for you actually to burn off everything that's accumulated. So don't eat too much. Quit the clean plate club. All right. Now you get to the interesting part, which is what should you choose to eat, what to eat. All right. And this is where um, there's a lot of logic to what we've heard already from everyone. A lot of things in the produce section, the grocery store, everything from, uh, you know, uh, brassica, you know, your sulforaphane containing broccoli and bok choy and cauliflower, your Swiss chard, all these things. Um, that are actually really tasty. If you look at Mediterranean cooking or Asian cooking, absolutely delicious. Sulforaphanes um, cause white fat to turn beige, turns on brown fat to turn on that space heater flame burning function. All right. Even redirects your stem cells from making more um, uh, white fat and makes them make more brown fat. So go to that, go to the produce section and knock yourself out with so many of these great um, foods. I, I put like 150 foods in there uh, in my book. But here's the other thing. We're always told to shop the perimeter of the super supermarket. Yeah, please do. That's where most of the good stuff is. But in my book, I introduce um, uh, this idea that you should do a treasure hunt in the middle aisles. Don't be afraid. Go in there and look for the treasure. It's in there. And I try to tell you by writing out as if you were in my shopping cart, What's the real gold you want to find for your metabolism? And to ignore the fool's gold, right? Go into that mine and look for the real gold. Um, uh, beans um, uh, can be useful for you. Lentils, uh, uh, some olive oils, really great olive oils. Um, I, I know that this is an area that you're very passionate about, as have I. Uh, hydroxytyrosol, the, you know, there's so many other bioactives in there. Um, dried mushrooms, uh, uh, dried chili peppers uh, as well. Uh, apple cider vinegar or actually, frankly, any vinegar, the acetic acid that makes vinegar vinegar actually turns out to prevent little fat cells from filling up as fast and as filled uh, as uh, when you're trying to fill up your gas tank um, as, as it might want to do otherwise. And so lots of ways uh, to actually control body weight, including the seafood section. And I talk about the uh, beverages. And uh, let's not even, let's just say we don't have to mention that having sodas with tons of added sugar or diet sodas with um, uh, non-nutritive artificial sweeteners that poison your gut microbiome. Let's just move that aside and say, look, we, we know that's not good for you. But even like fruit juices and things like that, they can contain a ton of sugar. I read in my book that, look, uh, I, I love orange juice. I grew up drinking orange juice, right? Um, but if you had a choice between eating one delicious orange, juicy orange, versus having a tall glass of orange juice. Here's where it goes. Both have bioactives that are fat fighting like hesperidin and aerogenin, okay? Both have dietary fiber if you get juice with pulp in it, all right? But the thing is I could drink, gulp down a tall glass of orange juice in 30 seconds and it would taste really good, all right? Um, but, I would, but it would take me a little while to eat a whole orange. You know, I'll take my time, maybe 10 minutes if I'm snacking on it. 
However, there's a lot of sugar in an orange, but in a tall glass of orange juice, it would take eight oranges to make a tall glass. And I would never sit down and eat the sugar of eight oranges. So when you talk about nutrient dense foods for fruit beverages, fruit drinks, it's always better to go for the whole fruit to get the taste of it rather than guzzle down all the other uh, uh, the extra sugars. It is nutrient dense, but you just get a lot more sugar that way. So when I talk about for beverages, I do mention a few juices that are standouts. But uh, what I say is that there's a holy trinity of beverages when it comes to body fat, metabolism, brown fat, and they fall into th the holy trinity is water, tea, and coffee. Those three have been shown in the lab, in the clinic, and in epidemiological studies to actually activate your metabolism, help you optimize your metabolism. Yeah, and uh, I would add a proviso, please don't put milk into your coffee or tea. Uh, Absolutely. And, and we know that, you know, cultures that uh, don't add milk to their coffee or tea actually have much better health than cultures who do drink coffee or tea but put milk in them. And unfortunately, it binds the polyphenols. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, and, and just really to amplify that point a little bit, because you and I are scientists and we can comfortably talk about this, is that, you know, dairy is fatty and fat forms little soap bubbles around pretty much anything it gets into because it rather stick to each other. When you put dairy into tea or coffee, it naturally, the dairy naturally forms tiny little invisible soap bubbles that wrap around the polyphenols. And so when you drink them, what's happening is that those polyphenols, a lot of them are stuck within the soap bubble and a lot less is absorbed in your gut. So you actually wash a lot of it out. It doesn't actually destroy the polyphenols, but it blocks it from your body from absorbing it. On top of that, other th additives to coffee and tea that many cultures do that I really think from a health perspective, you should cut down or cut out. Please don't add a ton of sugar to it. Please don't squirt artificial flavorings into it you know, that you would get at a drive through and, and, you know, and, and also don't put non-nutritive sweeteners in it either. So mother nature gave us, you know, the gift of these beverages, these brews, um, uh, in, in their pure form. And it's wonderful to actually uh, drink them that way. Yeah. One of my other sayings is more bitter, more better. And you and I would both agree with that as well. That's the way mother nature gave it to us. And we should pay attention you're definitely going to want to see this one. Make sure you never buy a nonstick cookware that says Teflon. And you can still see them lining the store shelves, so put them down.